The Massachusetts Bay Colony was an English settlement on the east coast of North America in the 17th century around the Massachusetts Bay, the northernmost of the several colonies later reorganized as the province of Massachusetts Bay. The lands of the settlement were located in southern New England in Massachusetts, with initial settlements situated on two natural harbors and surrounding land, about 15.4 miles kilometers apart the areas around Salem and Boston. The territory nominally administered by the colony covered much of central New England, including portions of Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. Territory claimed but never administered by the colonial government extended as far west as the Pacific Ocean. The earlier Dutch colony of New Netherlands disputed many of these claims, arguing that they held rights to lands beyond Rhode Island up to the western side of Cape Cod and the Plymouth Colony. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was founded by the owners of the Massachusetts Bay Company, which included investors in the failed Dorchester Company that had established a short-lived settlement on Cape Ann in 1623. The colony began in 1628 and was the company's second attempt at colonization. It was successful, with about 20,000 people migrating to New England in the 1630s. The population was strongly Puritan, and its governance was dominated by a small group of leaders who were strongly influenced by Puritan religious leaders. Its governors were elected, and the electorate were limited to freemen who had been examined for their religious views and formally admitted to the local church. As a consequence, the colonial leadership exhibited intolerance to other religious views, including Anglican, Quaker, and Baptist theologies. The colonists initially had good relationships with the local Indian populations, but frictions developed that ultimately led to the Pequot War (1636–38) and then to King Philip's War (1675–78), after which most of the Indians in southern New England made peace treaties with the colonists, apart from the Pequot tribe, whose survivors were largely absorbed into the Narragansett and Mohegan tribes following the Pequot War. The colony was economically successful, engaging in trade with England and the West Indies. A shortage of hard currency in the colony prompted it to establish a mint in 1652. Political differences with England after the English Restoration led to the revocation of the colonial charter in 1684. King James II established the Dominion of New England in 1686 to bring all of the New England colonies under firmer crown control. The Dominion collapsed after the Glorious Revolution of 1688 deposed James, and the colony reverted to rule under the revoked charter until 1691, when a new charter was issued for the province of Massachusetts Bay. This province combined the Massachusetts Bay territories with those of the Plymouth Colony and proprietary holdings on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Sir William Phipps arrived in 1692 bearing the charter and formally took charge of the new province. The political and economic dominance of New England by the modern state of Massachusetts was made possible in part by the early dominance in these spheres by the Massachusetts Bay colonists. History Prior to the arrival of European colonists on the eastern shore of New England, the area around Massachusetts Bay was the territory of several Algonquin-speaking tribes, including the Massachusetts, Nowsets, and Wampanoags. The Penacooks occupied the Merrimack River Valley to the north, and the Neepmukes, Pocumtooks, and Mohicans occupied the western lands of Massachusetts, although some of those tribes were under tribute to the Mohawks, who were expanding aggressively from upstate New York. The total Indian population in 1620 has been estimated to be 7,000. This number was significantly larger as late as 1616. In later years, contemporaneous chroniclers interviewed Indians who described a major pestilence which killed as many as two thirds of the population. The land use patterns of the Indians included plots cleared for agricultural purposes and woodland territories for hunting game. Land divisions among the tribes were well understood. During the early 17th century, several European explorers charted the area, including Samuel de Champlain and John Smith. Plans began in 1606 for the first permanent British settlements on the east coast of North America. On April 10, 1606, King James I of England granted a charter forming two joint stock companies. 
Neither of these corporations was given a name by this charter, but the territories were named as the First Colony and Second Colony, over which they were respectively authorized to settle and to govern. Under this charter, the First Colony and the Second Colony were to be ruled by a council composed of 13 individuals in each colony. The charter provided for an additional council of 13 persons named Council of Virginia, which had overarching responsibility for the combined enterprise. The First Colony ranged from the 34th to 41st degree latitude north, the Second Colony ranged from the 38th to 45th degree latitude. Note that the First Colony and the Second Colony overlapped. The 1629 Charter of Charles I asserted that the second colony ranged from 40th to 48th degrees north latitude, which reduced the overlap. Investors from London were appointed to govern over any settlements in the first colony. Investors from the town of Plymouth in the county of Devon were appointed to govern over any settlements in the second colony. The London Company proceeded to establish Jamestown. The Plymouth Company under the guidance of Sir Ferdinando Gorges covered the more northern area, including New England, and established the Sagardahoc Colony in 1607 in Maine. The experience proved exceptionally difficult for the 120 settlers, however, and the surviving colonists abandoned the colony after only one year. Gorges noted that, "...there was no more speech of settling plantations in those parts," for a number of years. English ships continued to come to the New England area for fishing and trade with the Indians. <inaudible> Plymouth Colony In December 1620, a group of pilgrims established Plymouth Colony just to the south of Massachusetts Bay, seeking to preserve their cultural identity and attain religious freedom. Plymouth's colonists faced great hardships and earned few profits for their investors, who sold their interests to them in 1627. Edward Winslow and William Bradford were two of the colony's leaders and were likely the authors of a work published in England in 1622 called Mort's Relation. This book in some ways resembles a promotional tract intended to encourage further immigration. There were other short-lived colonial settlements in 1623 and 1624 at Weymouth, Massachusetts. Thomas Weston's Wessagusset colony failed, as did an effort by Robert Gorges to establish an overarching colonial structure. Topic: <laughs> Cape Ann Settlement. In 1623, the Plymouth Council for New England successor to the Plymouth Company established a small fishing village at Cape Ann under the supervision of the Dorchester Company, with Thomas Gardner as its overseer. This company was originally organized through the efforts of Puritan minister John White of Dorchester, in the English county of Dorset. White has been called, "...the father of the Massachusetts colony." because of his influence in establishing this settlement and despite the fact that he never emigrated. The Cape Ann settlement was not profitable, and the financial backers of the Dorchester Company terminated their support by the end of 1625. Their settlement was abandoned at present-day Gloucester, but a few settlers remained in the area, including Roger Conant, establishing a settlement a little further south, near the village of the Naumkeg tribe. Legal formation of the colony Archbishop William Lord was a favorite advisor of King Charles I and a dedicated Anglican, and he sought to suppress the religious practices of Puritans and other nonconforming beliefs in England. The persecution of many Puritans in the 1620s led them to believe that religious reform would not be possible while Charles was king, and many decided to seek a new life in the new world. John White continued to seek funding for a colony. On the 19th of March 1627 eighths, the Council for New England issued a land grant to a new group of investors that included a few from the Dorchester Company. The land grant was for territory between the Charles River and Merrimack River that extended from the Atlantic and Western Sea and Ocean on the East Party, to the South Sea on the West Party. 
the company to whom the grant was sold was styled, the New England Company for a Plantation in Massachusetts Bay. The company elected Matthew Craddock as its first governor and immediately began organizing provisions and recruiting settlers. The company sent approximately 100 new settlers with provisions to join Conant in 1628, led by Governor's assistant John Endicott, one of the grantees. The next year, Naumkeg was renamed Salem and fortified by another 300 settlers led by Rev. Francis Higginson, one of the first ministers of the settlement. The first winters were difficult, with colonists struggling against starvation and disease, resulting in numerous deaths. The company leaders sought a royal charter for the colony because they were concerned about the legality of conflicting land claims given to several companies, including the New England Company, for the little known territories of the New World, and because of the increasing number of Puritans who wanted to join them. Charles granted the new charter on 4 March 1628 9, superseding the land grant and establishing a legal basis for the new English colony at Massachusetts. It was not apparent whether Charles knew that the company was meant to support the Puritan emigration, and he was likely left to assume that it was purely for business purposes, as was the custom. The charter omitted a significant clause, the location for the annual stockholders' meeting. Charles dissolved Parliament in 1629, whereupon the company's directors met to consider the possibility of moving the company's seat of governance to the colony. This was followed by the Cambridge Agreement later that year, in which a group of investors agreed to emigrate and work to buy out others who would not emigrate. The Massachusetts Bay Colony became the first English chartered colony whose board of governors did not reside in England. This independence helped the settlers to maintain their Puritan religious practices without interference from the King, Archbishop Lord, or the Anglican Church. The charter remained in force for 55 years, Charles II revoked it in 1684. Parliament passed legislation collectively called the Navigation Acts which attempted to prevent the colonists from trading with any nation other than England. Colonial resistance to those acts led King Charles to revoke the Massachusetts Charter and consolidate all the colonies in New England, New York, and New Jersey into the Dominion of New England. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Colonial History. A flotilla of ships sailed from England beginning in April 1630, sometimes known as the Winthrop Fleet. They began arriving at Salem in June and carried more than 700 colonists, Governor John Winthrop, and the Colonial Charter. Winthrop delivered his famous sermon, City Upon a Hill, either before or during the voyage. For the next ten years, there was a steady exodus of Puritans from England, with about 20,000 people emigrating to Massachusetts and the neighboring colonies during the Great Migration. Many ministers reacted to the repressive religious policies of England, making the trip with their congregations, among whom were John Cotton, Roger Williams, Thomas Hooker, and others. Religious divisions and the need for additional land prompted a number of new settlements that resulted in Connecticut Colony by Hooker and the Colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations by Williams and others. Minister John Wheelwright was banished in the wake of the antinomian controversy like Anne Hutchinson, and he moved north to found Exeter, New Hampshire. The advent of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms in 1639 brought a halt to major migration, and a significant number of men returned to England to fight in the war. Massachusetts authorities were sympathetic to the parliamentary cause and had generally positive relationships with the governments of the English Commonwealth and the Protectorate of Oliver Cromwell. The colony's economy began to diversify in the 1640s, as the fur trading, lumber, and fishing industries found markets in Europe and the West Indies, and the colony's shipbuilding industry developed. The growth of a generation of people who were born in the colony and the rise of a merchant class began to slowly change the political and cultural landscape of the colony, even though its governance continued to be dominated by relatively conservative Puritans. Colonial support for the Commonwealth created tension after the throne was restored to Charles II in 1660. Charles sought to extend royal influence over the colonies, which Massachusetts resisted along with the other colonies. 
For example, the Massachusetts Bay Colony repeatedly refused requests by Charles and his agents to allow the Church of England to become established, and the New England colonies in general resisted the Navigation Acts, laws that restricted colonial trade to England alone. All of the New England colonies were ravaged by King Philip's War 1675 when the Indians of southern New England rose up against the colonists and were decisively defeated, although at great cost in life to all concerned. The Massachusetts frontier was particularly hard hit, with several communities being abandoned in the Connecticut and Swift River valleys. By the end of the war, most of the Indian population of southern New England made peace treaties with the colonists. Revocation of Charter Following the English Restoration in 1660, matters of colonial administration drew the king's attention. Massachusetts in particular was reluctant to agree that the king had any sort of authority to control its governance. This led to crises in the 1660s and late 1670s in which steps were first planned, and then executed in England to vacate the colonial charter. The Lords of Trade had decided for a variety of reasons to consolidate the New England colonies. They issued quo warranto writs in 1681 for the charters of several North American colonies, including Massachusetts. The Massachusetts writ was never served for technical reasons, and the charter was not formally vacated until the Chancery Court issued a seer facias writ formally annulling the charter on June 18, 1684. The proceedings were arranged so that the time had expired for the colonial authorities to defend the charter, before they even learned of the event. <laughs> Unifications and restoration From 1686, the colony's territory was administratively unified by James II of England with the other New England colonies in the Dominion of New England. The Dominion was governed by Sir Edmund Andros without any local representation beyond hand-picked councillors, and was extremely unpopular in New England. Massachusetts authorities conspired to have Andros arrested in April 1689 after the 1688 Glorious Revolution in England, and they re-established government under the forms of the vacated charter. However, dissenters from the Puritan rule argued that the government lacked a proper constitutional foundation, and some of its actions were resisted on that basis. The years from 1689 to 1692 were also difficult ones, since the colony was at the forefront of King William's War, and its frontier communities were ravaged by attacks organized in New France and conducted by French and Indian raiding parties. King William III issued a charter in 1691, despite efforts by Massachusetts agents to revive the old colonial charter. It was chiefly negotiated by Increase Mather in his role as the colony's ambassador extraordinary, unifying Massachusetts Bay with Plymouth Colony, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and territories that roughly encompass present-day Maine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia to form the province of Massachusetts Bay. This new charter additionally extended voting rights to non-Puritans, an outcome that Mather had tried to avoid. Life Life could be quite difficult in the early years of the colony. Many colonists lived in fairly crude structures, including dugouts, wigwams, and dirt floor huts made using wattle and daub construction. Construction improved in later years, and houses began to be sheathed in clapboard, with thatch or plank roofs and wooden chimneys. Wealthier individuals would extend their house by adding a lean-to on the back, which allowed a larger kitchen possibly with a brick or stone chimney including an oven, additional rooms, and a sleeping loft. These houses were the precursors to what is now called the saltbox style of architecture. Interiors became more elaborate in later years, with plaster walls, wainscoting, and potentially expensive turned woodwork in the most expensive homes. Colonists arriving after the first wave found that the early towns did not have room for them. Seeking land of their own, groups of families would petition the government for land on which to establish a new town. The government would typically allow the group's leaders to select the land. These grants were typically about 40 square miles 10, hectares, and were located sufficiently near other towns to facilitate defense and social support. 
The group leaders would also be responsible for acquiring native title to the lands that they selected. By this means, the colony expanded into the interior, spawning settlements in adjacent territories as well. The land within a town would be divided by communal agreement, usually allocating by methods that originated in England. Outside a town centre, land would be allocated for farming, some of which might be held communally. Farmers with large plots of land might build a house near their properties on the outskirts of the town. A town centre that was well laid out would be fairly compact, with a tavern, school, possibly some small shops, and a meeting house that was used for civic and religious functions. The meeting house would be the centre of the town's political and religious life. Church services might be held for several hours on Wednesday and all day Sunday. Puritans did not observe annual holidays, especially Christmas, which they said had pagan roots. Annual town meetings would be held at the meeting house, generally in May, to elect the town's representatives to the general court and to transact other community business. Towns often had a village green, used for outdoor celebrations and activities such as military exercises of the town's trainband or militia. Topic: Marriage and family life. Many of the early colonists who migrated from England came with some or all of their family. It was expected that individuals would marry fairly young and begin producing offspring. Infant mortality rates were comparatively low, as were instances of childhood death. Men who lost their wives often remarried fairly quickly, especially if they had children needing care. Older widows would also sometimes marry for financial security. It was also normal for older widowed parents to live with one of their children. Due to the Puritan perception of marriage as a civil union, divorce did sometimes occur and could be pursued by both genders. Sexual activity was expected to be confined to marriage. Sex outside of marriage was considered fornication if neither partner was married, and adultery if one or both were married to someone else. Fornication was generally punished by fines and pressure to marry. A woman who gave birth to an illegitimate child could also be fined. Adultery and rape were more serious crimes, and both were punishable by death. Rape, however, required more than one witness, and was therefore rarely prosecuted. Sexual activity between men was called sodomy, and was also punishable by death. Within the marriage, the husband was typically responsible for supplying the family's financial needs, although it was not uncommon for women to work in the fields and to perform some sort of home labor, for example, spinning thread or weaving cloth, to supplement the family income. Women were almost exclusively responsible for seeing to the welfare of the children. Children were baptized at the local meeting house within a week of being born. The mother was usually not present because she was still recovering from the birth, and the child's name was usually chosen by the father. Names were propagated within the family, and names would be reused when infants died. If an adult died without issue, his or her name could be carried on when the siblings of the deceased named children in his memory. Most children received some form of schooling, something which the colony's founders believed to be important for forming a proper relationship with God. Towns were obligated to provide education for their children, which was usually satisfied by hiring a teacher of some sort. The quality of these instructors varied, from minimally educated local people to Harvard-educated ministers. Government. <laughs> <laughs> The structure of the colonial government changed over the lifetime of the Charter. The Puritans established a theocratic government with the franchise limited to church members. Winthrop, Dudley, the Rev. John Cotton, and other leaders zealously sought to prevent any independence of religious views, and many with differing religious beliefs including Roger Williams of Salem and Anne Hutchinson of Boston, as well as unrepentant Quakers and Anabaptists were banished. By the mid-1640s Massachusetts Bay Colony had grown to more than 20,000 inhabitants. The Charter granted the General Court the authority to elect officers and to make laws for the colony. Its first meeting in America was held in October 1630, but it was attended by only eight freemen. They formed the first Council of Assistants, and voted contrary to the terms of the Charter that the Governor and Deputy should be elected by them, from their number. 
This was modified in the next session of the General Court, in which the Governor and Deputy were to be elected by the General Court. An additional 116 settlers were admitted to the General Court as free men in 1631, but most of the governing power, as well as the judicial power, remained with the Council of Assistants. They also enacted a law specifying that only those men who are members of some of the churches in the colony were eligible to become free men and gain the vote. This restriction on the franchise was not liberalized until after the English Restoration. The process by which individuals became members of one of the colony's churches involved a detailed questioning by the church elders of their beliefs and religious experiences. As a result, only individuals whose religious views accorded with those of the church leadership were likely to become members and gain the ability to vote in the colony. After a protest over the imposition of taxes by a meeting of the Council of Assistants, the General Court ordered each town to send two representatives, known as deputies, to meet with the court to discuss matters of taxation. Questions of governance and representation arose again in 1634, when several deputies demanded to see the charter, which the assistants had kept hidden from public view. The deputies learned of the provisions that the General Court should make all laws, and that all freemen should be members of the General Court. They then demanded that the charter be enforced to the letter, which Governor Winthrop pointed out was impractical given the growing number of freemen. The parties reached a compromise, and agreed that the general court would be made up of two deputies elected by each town. The 1634 election resulted in the election of Dudley as governor, and the general court proceeded to reserve for itself a large number of powers, including those of taxation, distribution of land, and the admission of freemen. The transformation was complete, a trading company had become a somewhat representative democracy. A legal case in 1642 brought about the separation of the Council of Assistants into an upper house of the general court. The case involved a widow's lost pig and had been overturned by the general court, but the assistants had sat in judicial decision on the case and voted as a body to veto the general court's act. The consequence of the ensuing debate was that the general court voted in 1644 that the Council of Assistants would sit and deliberate separately from the general court they had sat together until then, the concurrence of both bodies being required for the passage of legislation. Judicial appeals were to be decided by a joint session, since otherwise the assistants would be in the position to veto attempts to overturn their own decisions. A group of emigrants had bought all the Massachusetts Bay Company's stock and brought the charter to America in 1630. Neither the English king nor parliament nor an English company exerted any influence in Massachusetts Bay Colony. So it was in effect a self ruling republic for some decades, also practicing separation of powers. Laws and judiciary In 1641, the colony formally adopted the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, written or compiled as its first code of laws by Nathaniel Ward. This document consisted of 100 civil and criminal laws based upon the social sanctions recorded in the Bible. These laws formed the nucleus of colonial legislation until independence, and contained some provisions that were later incorporated into the United States Constitution, such as the ideas of equal protection and double jeopardy. On the other hand, Massachusetts Bay was the first colony to legalize slavery with Provision 91 of the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, which developed protections for people who were unable to perform public service. Another law was developed to protect married women, children, and people with mental disabilities from making financial decisions. Colonial law differentiated among types of mental disabilities, classifying them as distracted persons, idiots, and lunatics. In 1693, poor laws enabled communities to use the estates of people with disabilities to defer the cost of community support of those individuals. Many of these laws remained until the American Revolution. Many behaviors were frowned upon culturally which modern sensibilities might consider relatively trivial actions, and some led to criminal prosecution. These included sleeping during church services, playing cards, and engaging in any number of activities on the Sabbath. Conversely, there were laws which reflected attitudes that are still endorsed by popular sensibilities in 21st century America, against things such as smoking tobacco, abusing one's mother-in-law, profane dancing, and pulling hair. 
Children, newcomers, and people with disabilities were exempt from punishment for such infractions. The Colonies Council of Assistance sat as the final court of appeal and as the principal court for criminal issues of life, limb, or banishment, and civil issues where the damages exceeded £100. Lesser offences were heard in county courts or by commissioners appointed for hearing minor disputes. The lower courts were also responsible for issuing licenses and for matters such as probate. Juries were authorized to decide questions of both fact and law, although the court was able to decide in the event that a jury failed to reach a decision. Sentences for offences included fines and corporal punishments such as whipping and sitting in the stocks, with the punishments of banishment from the colony and death by hanging being reserved for the most serious offences. Evidence was sometimes based on hearsay and superstition. For example, the ordeal of touch was used in 1646, in which someone accused of murder is forced to touch the dead body. If blood appears, the accused is deemed guilty. This was used to convict and execute a woman accused of murdering her newborn child. Bodies of individuals hanged for piracy were sometimes gibbeted publicly displayed on harbor islands visible to seagoing vessels. Notable criminal prosecutions One of the first people to be executed in the colony was Dorothy Talby, who was apparently delusional. She was hanged in 1638 for murdering her daughter, as the common law of Massachusetts made no distinction at the time between insanity or mental illness and criminal behavior. Midwife Margaret Jones was convicted of being a witch and hanged in 1648 after the condition of patients allegedly worsened in her care. The colonial leadership was the most active in New England in the persecution of Quakers. In 1660, one of the most notable instances was English Quaker Mary Dyer, who was hanged in Boston for repeatedly defying a law banning Quakers from the colony. Dyer was one of the four executed Quakers known as the Boston Martyrs. Executions ceased in 1661 when King Charles II explicitly forbade Massachusetts from executing anyone for professing Quakerism. <laughs> New England Confederation In 1643, Massachusetts Bay joined Plymouth Colony, Connecticut Colony, and New Haven Colony in the New England Confederation, a loose coalition organized primarily to coordinate military and administrative matters among the Puritan colonies. It was most active in the 1670s during King Philip's War. New Hampshire had not yet been organized as a separate province, and both it and Rhode Island were excluded because they were not Puritan. Topic. Economy and trade In the early years, the colony was highly dependent on the import of staples from England and was supported by the investments of a number of wealthy immigrants. Certain businesses were quick to thrive, notably shipbuilding, fisheries, and the fur and lumber trades. As early as 1632, ships built in the colony began trading with other colonies, England, and foreign ports in Europe. By 1660, the colony's merchant fleet was estimated at 200 ships and, by the end of the century, its shipyards were estimated to turn out several hundred ships annually. In the early years, the fleet principally carried fish to destinations from the West Indies to Europe. It was common for a merchant to ship dried fish to Portugal or Spain, pick up wine and oil for transport to England, and then carry finished goods from England or elsewhere back to the colony. This and other patterns of trade became illegal following the introduction of the Navigation Acts in 1651, turning colonial merchants who continued these trading patterns into de facto smugglers. Many colonial authorities were merchants or were politically dependent on them, and they opposed being required by the Crown to collect duties imposed by those acts. The fur trade only played a modest role in the colony's economy because its rivers did not connect its centers well with the Indians who engaged in fur trapping. Timber began to take on an increasingly important role in the economy, especially for naval purposes. After conflicts between England and the Dutch depleted England's supplies of ship masts, the colony's economy depended on the success of its trade, in part because its land was not as suitable for agriculture as that of other colonies such as Virginia, where large plantations could be established. 
The fishery was important enough that those involved in it were exempted from taxation and military service. Larger communities supported craftsmen skilled in providing many of the necessities of 17th century life. Some income producing activities took place in the home, such as carding, spinning, and weaving of wool and other fibers. Goods were transported to local markets over roads that were sometimes little more than widened Indian trails. Towns were required to maintain their roads, on penalty of fines, and the colony required special town commissions to lay out roads in a more sensible manner in 1639. Bridges were fairly uncommon, since they were expensive to maintain, and fines were imposed on their owners for the loss of life or goods if they failed. Consequently, most river crossings were made by ferry. Notable exceptions were a bridge across the Mystic River constructed in 1638, and another over the Saugus River, whose upkeep costs were subsidized by the colony. The colonial government attempted to regulate the economy in a number of ways. On several occasions, it passed laws regulating wages and prices of economically important goods and services, but most of these initiatives did not last very long. The trades of shoe-making and coopering barrel making were authorized to form guilds, making it possible to set price, quality, and expertise levels for their work. The colony set standards governing the use of weights and measures. For example, mill operators were required to weigh grain before and after milling, to ensure that the customer received back what he delivered minus the miller's percentage. The Puritan dislike of ostentation led the colony to also regulate expenditures on what it perceived as luxury items. Items of personal adornment were frowned upon, such as lace and costly silk outerwear in particular. Attempts to ban these items failed, and the colony resorted to laws restricting their display to those who could demonstrate £200 in assets. <laughs> <laughs> Demographics Most of the people who arrived during the first 12 years emigrated from two regions of England. Many of the colonists came from the county of Lincolnshire and East Anglia, northeast of London, and a large group also came from Devon, Somerset, and Dorset in the southwest of England. These areas provided the bulk of the migration, although colonists also came from other regions of England. The pattern of migration often centred around specific nonconformist clergy who sought to leave England under threat from Archbishop Lord, who encouraged their flock to accompany them. One characteristic unique to the New England colonies as distinguished from some of the other English colonies was that most of the immigrants were emigrating for religious and political reasons, rather than economic ones. The preponderance of the immigrants were well-to-do gentry and skilled craftsmen. They brought with them apprentices and servants, the latter of whom were sometimes in indentured servitude. Few titled nobility emigrated, even though some supported the emigration politically and financially and also acquired land holdings in Massachusetts and other colonies. Merchants also represented a significant proportion of the migrants, often the children of the gentry, and they played an important role in establishing the economy of the colony. With the start of the English Civil War in 1642, emigration came to a comparative standstill, and some colonists even returned to England to fight for the parliamentary cause. In the following years, most of the immigrants came for economic reasons, they were merchants, seamen, and skilled craftsmen. Following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, the colony also saw in an influx of French Protestant Huguenots. During the period of the Charter Colony, small numbers of Scots immigrated, but these were assimilated into the colony. The population of Massachusetts remained largely English in character until the 1840s. Slavery existed but was not widespread within the colony. Some Indians captured in the Pequot War were enslaved, with those posing the greatest threat being transported to the West Indies and exchanged for goods and slaves. Governor John Winthrop owned a few Indian slaves, and Governor Simon Bradstreet owned two black slaves. The Body of Liberties enacted in 1641 included rules governing the treatment and handling of slaves. Bradstreet reported in 1680 that the colony had 100 to 120 slaves, but historian Hugh Thomas documents evidence suggesting that there may have been a somewhat larger number. Geography <laughs> 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 The Massachusetts colony was dominated by its rivers and coastline. 
Major rivers included the Charles and Merrimack, as well as a portion of the Connecticut River, which has been used to transport furs and timbers to Long Island Sound. Cape Ann juts into the Gulf of Maine, providing harbors for fishermen plying the fishing banks to the east, and Boston's harbor provided secure anchorage for seagoing commercial vessels. Development in Maine was restricted to coastal areas, and large inland areas remained under native control until after King Philip's War, particularly the uplands in what is now Worcester County. <laughs> Boundaries The colonial charter specified that the boundaries were to be from 3 miles kilometers north of the Merrimack River to 3 miles south of the southernmost point of the Charles River and thence westward to the South Sea, i.e., the Pacific Ocean. At the time, the course of neither of the rivers was known for any significant length, which eventually led to boundary disputes with the colony's neighbors. The colony's claims were large, but the practicalities of the time meant that they never actually controlled any land further west than the Connecticut River Valley. The colony also claimed additional lands by conquest and purchase, further extending the territory that it administered. The southeastern boundary with the Plymouth Colony was first surveyed in 1639 and accepted by both colonies in 1640. It is known in Massachusetts as the Old Colony Line and is still visible as the boundary between Norfolk County to the north and Bristol and Plymouth counties to the south. The northern boundary was originally thought to be roughly parallel to the latitude of the mouth of the Merrimack River, since the river was assumed to flow primarily west. This was found not to be the case and, in 1652, Governor Endicott sent a survey party to locate the northernmost point on the Merrimack. At the point where the Pemijawasset River, the Merrimack's principal tributary, meets the Winnipesaukee River local Indians guided the party to the outlet of Lake Winnipesaukee, incorrectly claiming that as the Merrimack's source. The survey party carved lettering into a rock there now called Endicott Rock, and its latitude was taken to be the colony's northern boundary. When extended eastward, this line was found to meet the Atlantic near Casco Bay in present-day Maine. Following this discovery, the colonial magistrates began proceedings to bring existing settlements under their authority in southern New Hampshire and Maine. This extension of the colonial claim conflicted with several proprietary grants owned by the heirs of John Mason and Sir Ferdinando Gorges. The Mason heirs pursued their claims in England, and the result was the formation of the province of New Hampshire in 1679. The current boundary between Massachusetts and New Hampshire was not fixed until 1741. In 1678, the colony purchased the claims of the Gorges heirs, gaining control over the territory between the Piscataqua and Kennebec rivers. The colony and later the province and state retained control of Maine until it was granted statehood in 1820. The colony performed a survey in 1642 to determine its southern boundary west to the Connecticut River. This line, south of the present boundary, was protested by Connecticut, but stood until the 1690s, when Connecticut performed its own survey. Most of today's Massachusetts boundaries with its neighbors were fixed in the 18th century. The most significant exception was the eastern boundary with Rhode Island, which required extensive litigation, including Supreme Court rulings, before it was finally resolved in 1862. Lands which had previously belonged to the Pequots to the southwest were divided after the Pequot War in present day Rhode Island and eastern Connecticut. Claims were disputed in this area for many years, particularly between Connecticut and Rhode Island. Massachusetts administered Block Island and the area around present-day Stonington, Connecticut as part of these spoils of war, and was one of several claimants to land in what was known as Narragansett Country roughly Washington County, Rhode Island. Massachusetts lost all of these territories in the 1660s, when Connecticut and Rhode Island received their royal charters. <laughs> Topic. Timeline of settlement. Weymouth 1622 as part of Plymouth Colony, part of Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630 Gloucester 1623 Dorchester Company Chelsea 1624 Quincy 1625 Naumkeg, later Salem 1626 Dorchester Company 
Beverly 1626 originally a part of Salem, incorporated separately in 1668 Charlestown 1628 first capital, now part of Boston Lynn 1629 Saugus 1629 Manchester by the Sea Jefferies Creek 1629 Marblehead 1629 settled as a plantation of Salem, incorporated separately in 1639 Boston 1630 from Shaw Mutton Trimountain Medford 1630 Mystic now part of Malden 1630 Everett 1630 settlement Watertown 1630 on land now part of Cambridge Newton now Cambridge 1630 near Harvard Square Roxbury 1630 now part of Boston Dorchester 1630 now part of Boston Newton 1630 Ipswich 1633 Milton 1634 Attleborough 1634 Braintree 1634 Agawam 1635 settled as Agawam Plantation and originally administered by the Connecticut Colony, defected to Massachusetts with Springfield in 1640 Concord 1635 Hingham 1635 Newbury 1635 Dedham 1635 settled as contentment, renamed Dedham and incorporated in 1636 Winthrop 1635 Monotomy now Arlington, then part of Newton 1635 Situate 1636 Andover 1636 split into Andover and North Andover in 1856 Springfield 1636 settled as Agawam Plantation and originally administered by the Connecticut Colony, defected to Massachusetts and renamed Springfield in 1640 Brookline 1638 settled as Muddy River, considered part of Boston until it was renamed Brookline and incorporated in 1705 Rowley 1638 Salisbury 1638 Reading 1639 Lynn Village, renamed and incorporated as Reading in 1644 Sandwich 1639 first settled in 1637 Sudbury 1639 Winchester 1640 founded as part of Charlestown, incorporated as Waterfield in 1640, incorporated 1850 Chicopee 1640 settled as Nyazette Haverhill 1640 Braintree 1640 Malden 1640 founded as part of Charlestown, incorporated separately in 1649 Woburn 1640 Methuen 1642 founded as part of Haverhill, incorporated separately in 1725 Longmeadow 1644 Andover 1646 original settlement is now in North Andover Framingham 1647 Natick 1651 East Ham 1651 Medfield 1651 Billerica 1653 founded as Shawshan, incorporated in 1655 Chelmsford 1653 incorporated in 1655 Lancaster 1653 Lowell 1653 founded as East Chelmsford, was formally incorporated in 1826 Northampton 1654 incorporated in 1653 Groton 1655 Dunstable 1656 Hadley 1659 Middleton 1659 Holliston 1659 Marlborough 1660 Westfield 1660 West Springfield 1660 Milford 1662 Menden 1667 Middleborough 1669 Worcester 1673 Topic See also History of Massachusetts List of colonial governors of Massachusetts